Was that not amazing what God is doing right here at Christ Community Church when 113 people say, I'm going all in with Jesus, all in, all in. I love that. And you guys realize over 50 of those were students. Those are high school students uh, saying yes to Jesus for the very first time. And uh, very exciting to see them go public uh, in their faith. Whew. Two things always get me crying, baptisms and like kids in hospitals. If I talk about either of those, it just the floodgates uh, open up. Hey, uh, my name is Mark. I serve here as the lead pastor, and that baptism video is a great intro to our series that is the All In series that we're talking about. Those are people who have said we have gone all in, and uh, we've surrendered control of our life to God. And uh, we're talking about four different ways you surrender in order to get all in with God. We'll talk about control, we'll talk about your fears, we're going to talk about your pain, and we're going to talk about your strength. And uh, week number two this week is all about surrendering your fears, surrendering your fears. Now, uh, when you take a look at the surveys that are done about people's greatest fears, at least one of the most famous surveys out there identifies that our second greatest fear as Americans is death, the fear of death. You know what the number one fear on that survey is? Not North Korea, no. <laughs> it's, it's the fear of public speaking. The fear of public speaking. Something that has crippled me for my entire life. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld saw that survey and he said, you know what that means? That means if you go to a funeral, you would rather be the person in the casket than the one giving the eulogy, you know? And uh, people have all kinds of fears. I threw it out on Facebook to find out what your fears are at Christ Community Church. There was death, dying, snakes, spiders, sharks, those all made the list. One woman, Kat Jones, said this, honestly, when I realized how little control I actually have in this life, I and accepted that anything can and probably will happen, all my fear sort of dissolved. Even when it creeps back during uncertainty, it doesn't take long to remember that there's nothing to be afraid of if you really trust God. Nothing to be afraid of. Except clowns. <laughs> clowns are the worst. <laughs> now, you got a stone when you walked in. I hope you guys got a stone. You guys all have a stone in your hand? I want to invite you while I give the message to just kind of hold that stone in your hands. And uh, have a, just a little tactile experience as we go through this. And we'll come back to this later. We're going to be taking a look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. If you want to get your Bibles out, we'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And uh, you probably have guessed by the stone in 1 Samuel 17 that the story that we're going to be tackling is the story of David and Goliath. Now most people, whether you've been to church or not to church growing up, have heard the story of David and Goliath one way or another, which is a great thing. But the sad thing is that most of us leave this story in kind of a five-year-old zone where it's the story of the little guy beating up the big guy, and it becomes an inspirational locker room talk for football teams that are never going to win the next game. But the truth is that there is way more to the story of David. I wasn't talking about any particular team. <laughs> I mean, seriously, <laughs> Illinois got slaughtered this week too, just so you know. Uh, but <laughs> I was talking about David and Goliath, for real. The truth is, this is a multi-textured story that's got all kinds of national power issues, family issues, internal issues that go throughout. And today we're going to look at this story through the lens of one of the key themes, and that is the lens of surrendering our fears. So we're going to start in 1 Samuel 17, verse 1. 1 Samuel 17, verse 1. If you're ready to roll with the message, say, ready to roll. Ready to roll. It says this. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damim between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. All right, let's stop for a moment for a geography lesson here. The valley of Elah is where this battle happened. I got to visit the Valley of Elah when I went to Israel, and this is a picture from the top of the hill where the Israelites would have been camping overlooking the Valley of Elah. 
You can see off in the distance is where the Philistine camp would have been. And uh, the, the champions would have met right in the middle. Or if the armies came to battle, they would have met in the middle in that, uh, in that valley where there would be no strategic advantage for one side or the other. Now this valley is about 14 miles to the west of Bethlehem where David grew up. It was about six miles to east of Gath uh, where, uh, where Goliath would have we're going to throw the stone later, but not yet. Uh, where Goliath would have grown up. And in that place uh, was where the armies gathered to face one another. And an army would always look for the strategic high ground. They were both on the top of a hill for a reason, because there's a military advantage to being higher than your enemy, because it's a lot easier to kill somebody who's below you than somebody who is above you. And so they would camp on these hills. Now the Israelites had a lot to be afraid of. They didn't want to meet the Philistines even on equal ground because the Philistines had a significant technological advantage over them. And that's this. The Philistines had entered into the Bronze Age or the Iron Age. So they were able to craft weapons and armor. The Israelites had not yet entered that. They were more like the country bumpkins who lived up in the hills. And they were dependent on the Philistines to be the ones who would do their blacksmithing because they were ahead of the curve. So the Israelites, we find out in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 13, that the Israelites only had two swords in their entire army. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had a sword. Everybody else, when they came to fight, they came to fight with their staff or their sickle or their axes. They were using farm implements as weapons and didn't have the uh, metal kind of armor to face off to the other army. So the Philistines had all of the advantages. And it's no surprise that the Israelites sat up on the top of a hill. Now sometimes in a battle like this one in the ancient world, each of the two sides would choose a champion to meet one another in the middle. And they would determine that whoever won that battle between the champions, they would determine that that's the will of the gods, and then they would subject themselves to whatever the results of that battle were. So you would have the results of a battle, but you wouldn't have to have everybody be killed in order to get to those results. Well, this is what happened in this case. Look at verse 4. A champion named Goliath, who is from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Now I want to give you an idea of just how big this guy is translated into our kind of measurements. So I'm six feet three inches tall. Goliath was nine feet nine inches tall. That's six cubits and a span. Now some people are skeptical that this size could even happen in the human population in the ancient world. But you should know that there are two other ancient sources outside of the Bible that record this kind of height at this time. In Papyrus Anastasi, in about 1315 B.C., it was spoken of the fierce warriors of Canaan who were seven to nine feet tall. Two female skeletons were also found by archaeologists in the Transjordan area dated to about 1200 B.C., and each of these female skeletons was between seven and eight feet tall. It seems as though there was at least a subpopulation of very large people that were active during a time in the Middle East. Goliath was one of them. And we find out that his spearhead was 15 pounds. Just the tip of his spear weighed 15 pounds. His armor was 120 pounds. Football pads today wear approximately, or, or weigh approximately 11 to 19 pounds, including the helmet, Goliath is wearing 120 pounds worth of armor. He was a big dude. Goliath, nine foot nine. Now I want to get you an, an idea of how big David was in comparison to Goliath. So in order to help me out, I'm going to have Bowen Mark Hackle come up here. And uh, Bowen's going to help me out as a, a little illustration. Bowen, come on up here. Let's welcome Bowen onto the stage. Look at this guy. You got knuckles for me? Yeah. How old are you, Bowen? Six. Six years old. Okay. 
So here's what I want you to see. I'm six feet three inches tall, and Bowen is shorter than that. <laughs> Goliath was nine feet nine, and what we did is we measured out the proportion between David and Goliath. David would have been five feet six inches tall if he was an average Israelite. So the difference in size for David and Goliath would be like the difference in size between me and Bowen. How does that make you feel, Bowen? Good. Good. <laughs> Bowen, I know that you're somebody who's not too keen on picking fights, uh, but if you were going to pick a fight, would you choose to fight me? Yeah, with a Nerf gun. <laughs> with a what gun? No. A Nerf gun. A Nerf gun. He would take me out with that Nerf gun. Hey, if you've got the right battle, if you've got the right weapons and God is on your side, you can do anything, right? Right on. Okay, give me some knuckles here. Hey, everybody, give it up for Bowen. Bowen, Mark Hackle. Good job, buddy. You can head on back down. So I want you to think about the size differentiation that's there, this huge guy. So here's what it says, uh, verse 8. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? <laughs> like, bad guy, Eastern European accent always goes together. Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight together. And on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Dismayed and terrified. And then listen to this. One more verse about this. Verse 16 says, For 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Can you imagine that? Being taunted every day, morning and evening for 40 days. The first thing that you hear when you wake up in the morning is the taunts of Goliath coming after you and your army. The last thing you hear before you go to bed is that Eastern European accent ringing through your head. And here's the deal. Everybody around you is not willing to confront the giant. you got a whole army of people and not one is willing to step up to the plate. Psychologists have a term that they use called learned helplessness. And it's a term that's designed for people who don't face their fears. If you don't face your fears day after day after day, if you let your fears get the best of you and you don't tackle your fears with courage, what you find is that you begin to think that you're actually helpless against those fears. And you begin to act as if there's nothing that you can do to overcome your fears. That's learned helplessness. And you know what I would think was happening in the army on that hillside that day? I think while they stood on that hillside, nobody stood up to Goliath. A little something inside of them died every day. And they became more and more fearful. And more and more convinced that there was nothing that they could do to overcome this. It's so learned helplessness. And I believe that there's people who are sitting right here in this room and in the gym who have a fear that's been dogging you day after day, week after week, month after month, and you've persuaded yourself that you will never overcome that fear. But today, I believe differently. I believe that one smooth stone plus the power of God can slay any giant that's come across your life. People have all kinds of fears. And I want to ask you today to begin considering what that fear might be for you. What that fear might be for you. What is the Goliath that you just need to take this rock in your hand and throw it at him? People come to church from all different places with all different kinds of fears. One of the biggest is probably the fear of failure. And if I was to identify my greatest fear, as I tried to do with some contemplation this week... I think fear of failure is probably my biggest fear. You know, I have fears that I'll work really hard on developing a great message for the people at Christ Community Church, and thousands of people will show up, and, and nobody's life will be changed at the end of the morning. And I have a fear that 
Maybe I'll take a big risk as a leader and I'll step out in faith and invest some resources and say, everybody, let's go. And I'll look over my shoulder and nobody will be following me. And I have some fears that, you know, as a dad, I'll invest my life in my four kids who matter so much to me and, and I'll fail one or all of them as a father. These fears have dogged my life. What's, what's your greatest fear? Some people have a huge amount of fear around the potential of pain and suffering. Pain and suffering. And think about the possibility of being in the hospital, having medical issues. Or maybe you have those medical issues. And that's just a fear that dogs your mind. Some people have a fear around loneliness. Maybe you're experiencing it right now. Maybe you strategically move your life so that you will never experience that kind of loneliness. Some people have a fear of death. You don't know what's on the other side. Other people don't fear death so much as they fear dying, the process of getting to death. They say, I know my eternity is secure. I just don't want to have to go through a slow process of decline to get there. Some people fear abandonment. Some people fear being forgotten. Some people fear having their weaknesses exposed publicly. That number one fear of public speaking, I think, is actually a fear that masks a deeper fear inside of people. That's the fear of rejection, the fear of embarrassment, the fear of being ostracized, the fear of looking like a fool. And the bigger the audience is that you look like a fool in front of, the bigger the fear is about it. I'm not sure what your fears are. I heard this week that the greatest fear of older women is the fear of growing old and not being noticed. The greatest fear of older men is the fear of not having a voice, not having your opinion matter in other people's lives. So I want to take just one minute of silence and reflection give you the opportunity to hold this rock in your hand and just ask yourself the question, maybe even pray a prayer and say, God, what is my biggest fear? If I was to take one fear out of my life right now, what would that fear be? So Ryan's going to play a little bit in the background. I'm just going to give you 60 seconds to contemplate what's a fear that might be in your life. Go ahead and take that to God right now. I don't know what you've come from this week or what fears God might have brought to the front of your mind during that time. But it's interesting in this story that we, the people of God, are represented by the Israelite army that stands there cowering in fear, people who have not yet addressed their fears. But fortunately, there's a turning point in this story. It's a turning point where a new character enters onto the scene. It's David, all five foot six and 15 years old of him, comes running onto the scene, and David comes sent by his father Jesse to bring supplies to his older brothers who are in the army on the front lines of the battle. And when he encounters them, this is what it says in verse 22. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. 
and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Notice what David sees. Here's his army. Here's his champions. Here's his big brothers. And one guy comes out and yells, all of them cower in fear. Verse 25. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He'll also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the, man, the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him this is what will be done for the man who kills him. Now, did you notice in verse 26 that David never uses the word if. Like, what happens if God, if this giant gets killed? What happens if somebody slays him? No, no, no. For David, it's just a matter of when. He's like, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? This guy is outside of the covenant family of God. He's defying our very God. Certainly whoever goes against him is going to kill him. So what kind of loot does the guy get who wins the battle? And he finds out that the loot that he would get is great wealth from the king, the king's daughter in marriage, and the IRS is off your back for the rest of your life. Who does not want that? So David goes up to Saul, the king, and he's like, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. <laughs> I love that he uses that phrase, lose heart. It shows up all throughout the story of David, because David is a man after God's own heart. Man looks to the outward appearance, but God looks to the heart. David says, let nobody lose heart on account of this Philistine. I'll go and fight him. And Saul replies, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he's been a warrior from his youth. In other words, David, you're outclassed. You're like a junior high basketball player going against Shaquille O'Neal. You just don't have a chance. But David said to Saul, verse 34, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came off, carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion, the paw of the bear, will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said, Go, <laughs> and may the Lord be with you. David's got a whole different mindset than everybody else in the Israelite army. He hasn't become accustomed to the groupthink. He hasn't died a little bit every day on the hillside. He comes out from a very different kind of an experience. And there are four things true about David that allow him to be able to face his fears when the rest of the Israelite army does not. Four lessons we can learn from him. Lesson number one is you got to win your everyday battles. you got to win your everyday battles. For David, his everyday battles were fought in a field with a bunch of sheep. And he didn't just roll over and lose when a lion came and carried off one of the sheep. He went after it. He struck it. He seized it by the hair, and he killed it. And if you're going to defeat your Goliath, if you're going to go against your fear, you need to exhibit courage in your everyday battles. Now, your everyday battles might be small things, like having the courage to do the right thing on expense reports at work. It might be having the courage to stand up to peer pressure. When people are going one way, you would go the other way. It might be the courage to invite an outsider to sit at your table in the lunchroom. It might be having the courage to respond with patience to your group of toddlers that you're watching for that day. It might be extending grace to taking someone who's taking advantage. Winning your everyday battles conditions you to be a warrior. You see, David did not go from the life of an accountant or a pharmacist to being a warrior. He didn't, it could be dangerous for people if they move straight from couch potato to military aggressor. David wins his everyday battles. Stories told of a guy 
who uh, winds up going to heaven. He stands at the pearly gates of heaven, and Peter's standing before him with the book of life. He reads the good deeds and the bad deeds of this guy, and he goes, eh, you know, I read your story. There's nothing really particularly good, nothing really particularly bad in your life. Can you at least tell me a story of something good that you did in your life? And the guy says, yeah, I got a story for you. Uh, So this one time, I came across a, a motorcycle gang that was harassing a young woman and picking on her. And I decided I had enough of that. So I grabbed myself a tire iron. I went up to the leader of that motorcycle gang, a big, hairy, ugly man with tattoos all over his body. I reached up and grabbed his nose ring and ripped it right out of his nose. I showed the rest of the tire, the the motorcycle gang, my tire iron. I said, this is going to happen to you if you keep harassing this young woman. And if you don't let her go, you're going to have to go through me first. Peter said, that is a pretty impressive good deed. It's not in your book. When did it happen? The guy said, about two minutes ago. (laughs) Sometimes you have to win your everyday battles before you go after Goliath. Verse 38, then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in hand, approached the Philistine. Lesson number two, you have to lean into your strengths. Lean into your strengths. See, Saul wanted to give David his armor. Only problem was, Saul was a 48 long, and David was a 34 short. The armor just didn't fit him. When David went into battle, he knew that his advantages over Goliath were not size or strength, or armor, David knew that his key advantages were speed and dexterity and distance and his sling. If he took on Saul's armor, he was actually taking on a disadvantage. Sometimes you just can't conquer your own fears with other people's tools, particularly if you're somebody who is an emerging generation leader. You may be able to use tools for your battle that the leaders of the generation before were unable to use because God has wired you differently. God has given you different tools to be used. So you don't try to be like somebody else in the way that you confront your fears. David chose five smooth stones. Do you still have one of these stones in your hand? You may wonder, why did, God, why did David choose stones to throw? Well, the stone that he chose was probably not the same size as the one in your hand. It was probably bigger. The stones they generally used in battle in the ancient world were between the size of a golf ball and a tennis ball. And they would put them in their slings and whip them over their heads, and they became incredibly accurate through practice at being able to sling a stone very fast. For comparison purposes, a fastball by Araldus Chapman can reach 105 miles per hour. A Venus Williams tennis serve can top out at 130 miles per hour. A stone in a sling, two different sources have said a stone in a sling can fly between 150 and 200 miles per hour. Imagine that, the size of a golf ball or a tennis ball flinging at you. You can imagine why this would be David's first choice. He stays far away and he uses deadly force. It was the first thing David thought of, but that stone was the last thing going through Goliath's mind. (laughs) If you didn't get it, it just went over your head. Verse 41. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked over David, he looked over and saw that he was little more than a boy glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. That's like the Philistine version of trash talking right there. David said to the Philistine, 
You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. So David's trying to trash talk back. He says kind of the same exact thing. This day I'll give your carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. But he's new, so we'll give him a break for copying on his taunts. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Third key to winning your battles against fear, the most important key by a long shot is trust in God. Trust in God. Did you notice David's comment? He didn't say, you come at me with sword and spear and javelin, I'm coming at you with a rock. He says, you got sword and spear and javelin, I have the power of the Lord Almighty. You defy the God of Israel, and you will pay the price. (laughs) You see, in this scenario, everybody, Goliath, the armies, everybody is looking at the odds, while David is looking at the gods. David looks at Dagon and Ashtoreth, the gods that Uh, the gods that Goliath would have been worshiping. And he goes, these are just made-up gods. These are just statues. They're figments of your imagination. They're not going to do anything for you. But David's God is the God who spoke, and the universe came into existence. He's the one who made the weapons. Heck, he's the one who made Goliath in the first place. Who's going to win that battle? David brings a theological perspective into his fears, And friends, when it comes to our fears, we must always focus on God and not on the odds. Because our God is always bigger than our fears. He will always win in life, in battle, in death. God wins. So trust in God. Amen? When Jesus came to this planet, he said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. He said, I've come that you might have life and have life in all of its fullness. He said, in this world, you'll have tribulation for sure, but be of good cheer because I have overcome this world. Life, peace, overcoming the world. This is the life that Jesus offers you. It's not a life where you're crippled by your fears. It's a life where because you trust in God, because you know Jesus, because you're full of the Holy Spirit, you're able to walk dead straight into your fears and knock them down with the power of God. Verse 48. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Notice how this stands in contrast to all the rest of the Israelites who fled in fear when Goliath taunted. So the fourth key is you got to run towards your fears. You've got to run towards your fears. When you die a little bit every day, when you've learned helplessness, you run away from your fears. But when you believe in the power of God, you can take one smooth stone and run towards your fears. For David, speed was his friend. Dexterity was his friend. But symbolically, he was running at his fears and taking a whack at him. He knew that he had the stone that would kill the giant. When you run at your fears with your stone in hand, you kill them. When you cower on the hillside, you die a little bit every day. Are you running at your fears with the power of God? You know, I gave you this stone today as kind of a memento. And some of you may want to keep this stone. Some of you may want to remember the fear that you have that's identified with this stone and put it on your desk or your counter or a place that will help you to remember that fear and how the power of God can help you overcome this fear. Others of you may want to take this stone and just go out to a field and symbolically chuck it. I mean, you may want to leave the church today and you know exactly what that fear is and it's just an act of defiance to throw that stone as hard as you can. Now I ask that you wait until you get past the parking lot before you throw the stone. But this might be something that you want to do as an act of defiance against your fears and a trust in the God who's behind you. Verse 49. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it. He struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. 
So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran over and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. And after he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. Boom. Game over. The entire fortunes of Israel were changed because a shepherd kid had the guts to face down a giant. Now, I want you to see this as a real historical story. But I also want you to know that this is a foreshadowing of the bigger God story that's out there. David was the shepherd turned anointed king who points us forward to Jesus, the good shepherd who's the ultimate anointed king. David stared down Israel's biggest enemy and Jesus stared down humanity's biggest enemy. David looked death in the face. Jesus looked death in the face. David carried nothing but a staff and a sling. Jesus carried nothing but a Roman cross. David was confident in a God-sized miracle to beat the odds. Jesus was confident in God's power for death to beat death. See, David fought alone, and he inspired courage into his army. Jesus fought alone and has now inspired courage in you and in me that our enemy death is defeated, so there is no longer any fear in this world that could defeat us because death and sin and Satan have been killed once and for all, and this is good news. Amen? Amen. David knocks down Goliath. Jesus knocks down death. What happens next? Well, when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. The men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sha'arim road from Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites turned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. I want you to notice that the Israelites were inspired by David's act of courage. (laughs) And they got out from behind the bushes and ran hard after the Philistines, six miles all the way to Gath. I hope that we're inspired by the courage of our hero as well. Because Jesus went first, because Jesus defeated death, because Jesus defeated sin and Satan, we can be the army that's behind him who is running full force after our fears and after our enemies. And nothing, nothing needs to stop us along the way. You know, the truth is, I'm glad that there's Goliath. I'm glad that there's pain and addiction and even death. Because it allows us to grow and press into God. It gives us opportunity for him to show himself strong. If there was nothing to be afraid of, we'd never have to hold God's hand tight. If there was nothing to conquer, we would never have to see God come to the rescue. Fears and Goliaths actually strengthen our faith. So one smooth stone and the power of God can conquer any giant. Now, I want to finish our message this morning by praying all of, over all of you. And what I want to do is I want to pray over you fear by fear. And in order to do that, I'm going to ask you to do something courageous. Ryan will be playing a little bit of music in the background. I'm going to have Jonathan and Polly come up here, and they're going to be ready to read some scripture over you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to recite a fear. And I'm going to invite you to have the courage to stand up if that's a fear that you can identify with. And we'll have six different fears and six different opportunities to stand up. And as you stand, either Jonathan or Polly, these are two of our residents here, will read a scripture that addresses that fear in particular. And I want you to receive that scripture as the truth of God, to let it wash over you, to let it enlighten your mind and transform you from the inside out knowing that the power of God and the truth of his word can conquer any fear. Now, I know that it's going to take some courage for people to stand up and admit that you've got a fear. That's one of those everyday battles. And when you win your everyday battles by doing things like admitting that you have a fear, then it prepares you for the moment when you have to face down your biggest fears because you have a track record of courage. So I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm going to name the fears. And just so you know what fears will be headed through, we'll be looking at a fear of failure, fear of pain and suffering, 
fear of loneliness, fear of death, a fear of evil or injustice being perpetrated against you, and a fear of financial loss. So let me pray for us, and then we'll go by fear by fear and read some scripture over you. Let's pray together. Father, I'm so grateful for the way that you have been at work here even this morning. I'm grateful for your power that's at work in us and through us to change us, and I'm grateful that there's no fear that's bigger than you and your strength to conquer. So we invite you to be at work in people's hearts, their minds, their lives, even in this moment. We ask you to do your good work in Jesus' name. So I'm going to start off with the fear of failure. And uh, if you're like me, failure's the one I'm standing up for. And you say, you know what the truth is in my life? There's some things that I fear failing at. Maybe it's in the marketplace. Maybe it's at home. Maybe it's with your family. But if you've got a fear of failure, go ahead and stand now and hear the word of the Lord. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41, verse 10. You can be seated. Second one is the fear of pain or suffering. Maybe you got medical issues that are going on with yourself or a member of your family right now. Maybe you're afraid that those medical issues will arise. If that's the case for your fear of pain and suffering, go ahead and stand up now and hear God's word spoken over you. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Psalm 34, 18. You can go ahead and be seated. Our third fear is the fear of loneliness. Fear of loneliness. Maybe you're lonely now. Maybe you're new to Omaha. Maybe you're just feeling far from God. (laughs) And you wish that God felt closer to you and you knew of his presence. If that's the case for you, I invite you to stand right now and hear the word of God spoken over you. The fear of loneliness. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Psalm 139, 7 through 10, and Jeremiah 29, verse 12. You can go ahead and be seated. The next one is the fear of death. If you say, hey, I've got a a fear of death that's going on in my life, or maybe it's not death, maybe it's the fear of dying and the process that you'll have to go through, or maybe it's the fear that when you get to that point, you won't die well. If that's the case for you, fear of death or dying. I'm going to invite you to stand right now where you're at. Stand right now if it's the fear of death or dying. Worship center and in the gym. And hear these powerful words spoken over you. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. He will swallow up death forever, and he will wipe away tears from all faces. Romans 6, 5, and Isaiah 25, 8. You can be seated. The next fear is the fear of evil or injustice, that something might be perpetrated on you or maybe perpetrated on your kids. If when you think of fear, you think of intruders or you think of calamity or you think of something desperate that might happen to you or your kids, why don't you go ahead and stand right now? Fear of evil or injustice, the fear of evil or injustice perpetrated on you or a loved one. And hear the word of the Lord. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. 
When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 3. You can be seated. And then our last one is the fear of financial loss. Financial loss. Maybe you've recently faced a job loss or you're about to face a job loss. Maybe you're facing bankruptcy. Maybe there's lawsuits that are in your present or maybe coming in your future. Or maybe it's just month to month. You're having a hard time paying the bills, making ends meet. If the fear of financial loss is big for you, then why don't you go ahead and stand right now. Fear of financial loss. Therefore, I tell you, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds in uh, in the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Matthew 6, 25 through 33. All right, you can be seated. I'm going to pray for us and then hand things over to the team and they'll sing a song. And I want you to just meditate on the power of God over everything that you might fear, both in the prayer and the song to follow. Let's pray together. God, we know that you tell us in your word that perfect love casts out fear. And Father, we depend today on your perfect love to be so big in our lives that fear becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So speak to us, we pray, God. Do something supernatural in our hearts. Give us courage beyond our personal selves. Help us to trust in you and to run after our fears, knowing that the power of God is inside of us and that with you by our side, we have nothing to fear. We pray for this in the mighty name of Jesus. And God's people said,